one of the familiar verses that refer from the Old Testament to the birth of Jesus is Micah 5.2, which goes like this. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. So a very familiar prophecy from Micah. And I want to spend several sessions putting this verse in context and unpacking it for our greater understanding of Jesus and how prophecy works. So, Father, as we spend a few sessions on this prophecy, would you grant understanding? Would you give us an appreciation for how the prophets thought and saw, predicted, judged? Grant us your help now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the only thing I want to do in this session is back up and put this verse in its wider context and give you a sense of how Micah and the other prophets spoke about the future distant and the future very near. So let's just go back. uh, Well, maybe just a word about Micah. Micah served about 750 to 700. You can see you count from big numbers to low numbers when you're B.C., before Christ. And this was the same period of time that Isaiah was prophesying, and they both prophesied more or less to the same set of kings as well. So back up just a few verses earlier to 4.11 to 5.1. This is the paragraph immediately preceding the one we just looked at. Now many nations are assembled against you, saying, who's you and who are these nations? Can we know? Well, we know this because of what he says. Let her be defiled. This is what the nations are saying. Now many nations are assembled against you, saying, they say, let her be defiled. Let our eyes gaze upon Zion. Zion was originally a term referring to a part of Jerusalem that was called David's city. David had conquered it. It came eventually to refer to uh, all of Jerusalem and then to God's uh, habitation for God's people, God's people. But they do not know. So this they here is these nations. So they're planning to, to defile Jerusalem and to gloat and gaze upon her in their triumphs. But the problem is they do not know the thoughts of the Lord. Oh, how we need to let that sink in. The nations go about their business, and they don't have any idea what God is really up to. They do not understand his plan. God always has a plan. God always has thoughts, and they're higher and different from the thoughts of man. That he is that he has gathered them, still the nations here, he has gathered them as sheaves to the threshing floor. So they think they're coming to defile and gaze upon Zion, and God is gathering them as sheaves, that is, bundles of grain that will be pounded out on the threshing floor until they become useful for his purposes. That's what grain is. Arise and thresh. So that's what you do here with these sheaves, these nations. So he's calling out, who? Arise, thresh, O daughter of Zion. Now, I've, I've studied as much as I can take the time to over the years and recently to try to discern why, why the city of Zion or the people of Zion are called the daughter of Zion. Why not sons? Why not offspring? And nobody has a sure answer. It might be that daughter implies a kind of settled home, men being, say, the warriors who are out fighting and, and the daughters providing the, the, the home that would be secure and safe and stable. And, and yet, I'm not so sure of that. I mean, that's just one possibility. 
I'm not sure, and you can do the further research search on your own, is why daughter of Zion would be often, very often in the Old Testament, referring to the, the city and the people of Zion. But look what it says. So, arise, thresh, O daughter of Zion, that meaning the, the people of Zion, the whole group. I will make your horn iron, picturing the horn like of, a, of an ox, iron, and I will make your hoofs bronze. So when you do this threshing here with your horn and your hoofs, oh my, it's going to be trouble. You shall beat in pieces many peoples, still referring to these nations that they thought they were going to get the upper hand. And they shall devote their grain to the Lord, their wealth to the Lord of the whole earth. Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. That's the same group of believers right there. Muster your troops. Siege is laid against us by these nations. With a rod, they shall strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. So here is an embattled situation against Israel and a prediction that Israel is going to rise up with might and strike with threshing those who come against her and are turned into sheaves by the Lord, which makes the next verse abrupt and far off, right? But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, and then it predicts the coming of Jesus. Now, I just want to step back for a moment and see how whether that is really strange or not. So you have a, a prediction here of conflict, enemies coming up against Israel, Israel uh, defeating her enemies, and then, and then you have this break. You don't know when this is going to happen here, but you have this break and this reference here to the coming of a, of a child being born. And we'll look into that in detail next time. But let's just step back to, say, chapter 2. Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it because it is the, in the power of their hand. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them away. They oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, against this family, I am devising a disaster from which you cannot remove your necks and you shall not walk haughtily for it will be a time of disaster. Now, I'm just pointing out here that this is Micah dealing with a present and immediate evil in Israel. And a prediction that is going to be dealt with by the Lord. Prophets like Micah deal with immediate evils. Prophets don't just deal with far off events. They tackle the moral condition of the people at the time. It's, to be prophetic is not just to tell the future. It's to tell God's word about the present situation and how God's going to deal with it. So that's a present reality and an, an imminent judgment. And then we go to chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the house of the wooded height. Now, that's just shocking. This is Zion, who we saw here, is going to be triumphant over these nations that are coming against them. But here... Zion is going to be defeated, plowed as a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of ruins. And we know that came in about the year 532 or so. So Micah is dealing with uh, more or less distant uh, issues. Like this one is going to be, what, a couple hundred years away. And uh, this one is dealing with an immediate issue. And then comes, let's go to chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established. Now, now we're back to Jerusalem being established as the highest of the mountains. And it shall be lifted up above the hills and people shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of, of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us. This is not nations coming to be defeated. This is nations coming to be taught his ways 
that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and shall decide disputes for strong nations far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares. Whoa, now we're off into the far future where God's going to make absolute and glorious peace in the earth beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Or just a few verses later in 4, 6, and 7, in that day, some future day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away and those who have afflicted and the lame I will make the remnant and those who were cast off a strong nation and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. Now, all I'm doing is pointing out that in this little book of Micah, as in all the prophets, the distant future and the immediate future, way down the line and just ahead, there are issues being dealt with. And they tend to merge. They flow like one verse after the other. And sometimes you have to just scratch your head and say, wait a minute, <laughs> is that a thousand years in the future? Or is that 200 years in the future? Or is that 700 years in the future? And we have all of those in this text, all of them. We have the time of swords being beaten into plowshares, which hasn't happened yet. We have a Messiah coming, which happened 700 years later. We have the destruction of Jerusalem, which happened 200 years later. So all I'm doing is saying, when we, when we try to put prophecies together, and this is the one we're looking at, we'll go into it next time, we have a, a, a prophetic perspective, it's called, in which the mountains that are far away are seen, the mountains that are close are seen, and sometimes when you, on a foggy day, look at a mountain range that has two, three, four ranges, they all look like one mountain, and that's the way they're sometimes described in the prophets. So we'll pick it up here next time and deal with the particularities of this prophecy.